This morning, Kiev was hit by a wave of Russian ballistic missiles. Our friend Julia Timoshenko experienced the strikes firsthand. Here's what she heard. As I woke up from the explosion, I've never ran so much quicker to my bathroom ever, trying to like hide. It lit up and hit something very nearby. I can hear explosions still. My building is shaking and I keep hearing the sound of missiles flying. I don't think I can confuse the sound of missile from anything that that whistle sound that you heard. I think it was a missile. Thank you very much to Julia for allowing us to use her audio, and we do hope you're safe. I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine. Discuss updates from Brussels as EU leaders meet. And we speak to Sarah Brown, chair of UK charity Their World, on their projects for Ukrainian schoolchildren. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Thursday, the 21st of March, two years and 26 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, Europe editor, James Crisp, and Telegraph contributor and former tank commander, Hamish de Bretton-Gordon. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So there's been a very large missile attack on Kyiv this morning, the first on the Ukrainian capital in 44 days. At the moment, we've got reports there's at least 13 people injured. No reports of deaths yet, but damage to homes and infrastructure throughout the city. So multiple explosions were heard from around 5 a.m. today. Ukraine's Air Force said that Russia had launched two ballistic missiles, as well as 29 KH-101 and KH-555 cruise missiles from the Volgodonsk area in Rostov Oblast. That's the Russian oblast that borders Ukraine directly to the east. And the Engels Air Base in Saratov Oblast, that's that's further further east, um, but about another 300 k's further east to borders Kazakhstan. Um, they say all 31 missiles were downed by Ukraine's air defence. Now, Sergei Popko, who's the head of Kyiv's military administration, said uh, crews and ballistic missiles had been raining down on the city from different directions, with air alerts lasting for nearly three hours. Mr Popko said Russia had used strategic bombers to carry out the attack whilst also launching missiles from uh, from its territory. Those strategic bombers, some of them at least, we think came from the Engels Air Base that was hit with drones two days ago. Mr Popko said... After a pause of 44 days, the enemy launched another missile attack on Kyiv. All emergency services are working on sites. Clearing the consequences of the missile attack is underway. Vitaly Klitschko, the mayor of Kyiv, warned of falling rocket debris and um, said there have been several fires across the capital. President Zelensky said that such terror continues every day and night. Uh, It is possible to put an end to it through global unity. This is entirely possible if our partners demonstrate sufficient political will. So, very large attack by the sound of it. I don't think it's ongoing at the moment, but it uh, it has been for the first few hours of this morning. Um, As I say, no deaths reported or that we've seen yet, but damage, widespread damage, and injuries. Now, a friend of mine in in Kiev got in touch. He said that he was telling me about it this morning, uh, and he just made the point that well, one of the reasons why there may not be so many or, or so many deaths and injuries, he said that the the city is built on very sandy earth, basically the banks of the Dnipro, uh, which historically was very marshy ground. And the result is that blasts from missiles that hit the ground, i.e. not drones or missiles that smash into buildings, but things that hit on the ground are largely contained by that soft, sandy uh, earth. It could have been a lot worse if the ground was more solid. Now, next, Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu 
He was speaking to the Russian Ministry of Defence board yesterday and discussed ongoing Russian military reforms intended to increase uh, the combat capabilities. Now, there's loads of numbers thrown around here. You'll see on social media and, um, and what have you. But um, let's try and make a bit of sense of it. He said Moscow had recruited enough soldiers to fill 30 formations. A formation is generally of, of division size or above, a division being 10,000-ish people, depending on its role. Um, but 30 of those, that, that's a lot. Uh, he said 14 divisions and 16 brigades. So a brigade is smaller than a division. Generally, you get about three brigades in, in one division, again, depending on, on role. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of new bits for the wire diagram. But where are these people going to come from? And I would just say there is a huge difference between an untrained, ill-equipped and poorly led individual just wearing green clothes and an actual soldier. So sure, you can bang on about all the reforms you want, but um, they're not going to have a, a, a hugely increased credible fighting force anytime soon. Now, that aside, the ISW, Institute for the Study of War, US-based think tank, they say that uh, the Russian military continues to undertake structural reforms to simultaneously support the war in Ukraine, while also expanding Russia's conventional capabilities for the long term. They say it's likely that Shoigu is suggesting that Russia is going to stand up two new divisions this year, in addition to the 12 divisions, air assault and motorised rifle divisions, that he announced in January last year. ISW assessed that Russia currently lacks the manpower, military infrastructure and training capacity to properly staff entirely new divisions in the immediate to medium term. Now, such reforms, they say, are more likely intended to build Russia's long-term military capability regarding NATO as opposed to any immediate requirement for Ukraine. They say, uh, ISW also say, several Russian financial, economic and military indicators at the moment suggest Russia is preparing for a large-scale conventional conflict with NATO, not imminently, but likely on a shorter timeline than what some Western analysts have initially posited. So a lot to take in there, but basically Russia is undergoing another one of its periodic enormous um, military structural reforms. It didn't work too well the last time it did it in the kind of early noughties. Um, some of that, the, the, the new formations just haven't worked and they've gone back to their sort of military district model. Also, some of the equipment hasn't worked. They said they were going to bring in the T-14 Armata super tank and uh, that's now only good for, for kind of driving up and down Red Square and looking fancy. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. But it is a it is a start warning there for MySW that actually if they are trying to build something for the long term with the view of combating NATO, that is a concern. Of course, what NATO does and the British military contributing to that is we, we take the Russian army, not only the Russian army, but we take Russia as as the sort of benchmark force to build ourselves against. So we should on on one hand be be concerned here but not too concerned you know it's them saying they're building it uh, against nato is probably to be expected however we'll keep an eye on that and just finally in the updates david visiting kiev today estonian defense minister hanna pavka announced uh, estonia's latest package of military assistance that's about 20 million euros 22 million us dollars in this package for recoilless anti-tank guns, um, explosives, various types of artillery, uh, sniper equipment, and lots of lots of small caliber ammunition. Uh, Dutch Defence Minister uh, Kaya Ollengren and uh, oh, sorry, connected to this, Dutch Defence Minister Kaya Ollengren and Ukraine's Deputy Defence Minister are also in. Uh, they are visiting combat units in Dnipropetrovsk Oblast yesterday. This comes in the back of Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte visiting a couple of weeks ago to Kharkiv, where he signed a 10-year agreement on security cooperation between Ukraine and the Netherlands. Before the current visit, um, Defence Minister Ollengren announced the procurement of 150 million euros worth of munitions for Ukraine's incoming F-16s. Um, later on, she visited uh, President Zelensky and discussed lots of other assistance. So, a bit of, bit of Euro, Euro mill um, stuff going on. I will make sense of this a bit later, I promise you. But just to finish here, David, we should note that Kaya Kallas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, was in Brussels yesterday. 
where she said, if Russia were to lose this war, then we don't have to worry about the Third World War. We want to have peace, but we want to have sustainable peace, and peace on Russia's terms is not sustainable. In some countries, I don't see the deed, I only hear the words. The problem is that we are in crisis now. We need to invest in defence now. Um, she said that President Macron's notion of sending Western troops should not be ruled out and supported his use of strategic ambiguity. She said, we've been guessing for so long what Russia is going to do next. I think it could be a good strategy that they start to guess what we will do next. So that's the kind of news. Then in my final thought later on, I'm just going to draw out those themes because I think it's very interesting uh, with regards to the jockeying for position of next NATO Secretary General. But I'll save that for the final thought, David. And that's, um, that's us all up to date. Thank you very much uh, for all of that, Dom Nichols. Thank you for talking us through that. Um, James Crisp, it's great to have you back on the podcast. There is an EU leaders meeting today in Brussels. Can you talk us through what's happening? I mean, Kai Callas, as, as Don was saying, is in uh, Brussels, but she's not the only one. EU leaders are meeting today for uh, one of their regular summits, and it's a summit which has got a lot to do with what's going on in Ukraine. President Zelensky is going to address the European Council, and then uh, the discussions will begin. As always, you know, they're not straightforward, but a couple of interesting ideas will be discussed by the heads of state and government. One of these ideas is a plan to use the profits of frozen Russian assets to rearm Ukraine's forces. So Joseph Burrell, who's the uh, EU's top diplomat, is proposing to transfer 90% of the proceeds of these frozen assets to a fund managed from Brussels that could buy weapons for Kyiv. Now that could ultimately raise up to 3 billion euros. That's important because, you know, we're in a situation where there are significant doubts over the level of American support for Ukraine. The Republicans continue to block the aid money in Congress and there are widespread European anxieties about what it would mean for Washington's support if Donald Trump was to win the next presidential election. This isn't going to sort of sail through the council. There are some countries, military neutral countries uh, like Ireland, Austria and Malta, who may not feel like they can go as far as uh, agreeing to this. And of course, we've also got the likes of Hungary and Slovakia, two, I think it's fair to say, two of the most Putin-friendly or Putin-adjacent EU and NATO uh, member states who you know, may well object. The leaders are going to talk a little bit about the 5 billion euro deal that they reached to fund weapons shipments to Ukraine. And they're going to welcome a, a Czech plan to buy ammunition to sort of bump up the ammunition levels that they've already promised to Kyiv. But sort of a breakthrough there was uh, an agreement that they could buy the ammunition from non-EU suppliers. Uh, Macron sort of caved on his uh, buy European red line in order to pave the way to that deal as part of his kind of new warlike persona. Uh, one of the issues where there is some division is how are you going to pay for this? Uh, some of the countries, I think including Estonia, they're in favour of the idea of euro bonds. So basically using debt to raise finance. Whereas France and Germany, they sort of believe that the EU countries are rich enough to kind of pay for it themselves. So there's going to be some discussion on that. It could go late. But basically the idea is if each country pays 2% of their GDP... You're talking about being able to raise 80 billion euros extra a year for defence. Finally, the draft of the summit conclusions makes mention of sanctions against Belarus, North Korea and Iran. So I think we can expect some measures to come against those three countries. The EU suspects that they are supplying Russia's army with weapons. So we have this situation where you have an effort to build up European levels of support, an effort which has been given extra impetus uh, due to flagging US support, going hand in hand with an effort to sort of choke off some of the supplies which are coming from, it's not a very journalistic way of putting it, but you know, baddie countries like North Korea, Iran, and uh, Belarus, one of Russia's closest allies. Something you mentioned when we chatted before this was how there may be a vote, but in practice there probably won't. Why not? Yeah, so, I mean, it's one of those things people say, oh, there will be a vote in the European Council. The European Council is when the 27 EU leaders get together 
in Brussels for a discussion. The problem is if you put something to a vote and a country is outvoted, you're highlighting divisions. Now, these summit talks, you know, they're held behind closed doors. As you can imagine, if you have a prime minister and a president chatting to each other or chatting among 27 of each other, there's going to be sensitive stuff which is discussed, market sensitive stuff, definitely politically sensitive stuff. You know, the idea of actually sitting down and getting people to stick their hands up and say, we are in favour of this, we are not. That's just a bit too much of a bitter pill to swallow. So it, it is general practice in the EU to avoid that kind of vote, if at all possible. Because if you have that vote, you have a winner, but you also have a loser. And you're not meant to have losers when you're in a, a diverse union of equals or working together. And just finally, James, you mentioned some updates on the EU enlargement plan. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're going to be discussing that. I think that's sort of interesting because, you know, the idea of Ukraine one day joining the EU. I mean, I can't see that happening while <laughs> Ukraine's at war. If borders are moving, you can't join uh, the EU. I, I think we've seen from the Brexit experience how important that kind of stuff is and how seriously the EU takes its the boundaries of its regulatory influence. But, you know, they are talking about how to sort of send out signals that Kyiv is on the path to joining the EU one day. And not just Kyiv, but also countries like Moldova, which uh, are under threat of Russian influence and Russian aggression, as well as the Western Balkans, of course. The Western Balkans countries, which uh, were in the queue, the waiting room, for far longer than uh, Ukraine has been. Again, that has sort of been an area where Russian influence has been noted, especially in places like Serbia. Back when Britain was a member of the EU, we were very much in favour of enlarging the EU to Western Balkan states in order to counter that malign influence. Well, thank you very much, James, for talking us through all of that. That was really fascinating. It's really good to have you back on the podcast. Hamish de Breton Gordon, earlier our own Dom Nichols described the T-14 Armata super tank as only good enough to sort of zoom up and down Red Square. Why is that? Yeah, the T-14 Armata. The, the Russians describe it too expensive and too valuable to use on the battlefield. If I was a Russian tank, I'd be pretty hacked off if that was the view coming down from my command. And I want to explain why I think it is a white elephant rather than this uh, super tank that the Russians say. Some of you might have seen a, a video posted by the UK MOD yesterday of the T-14, which I reposted this morning. And after I've given my case why I think it is a white elephant, people might want to go and have a look at it. The holy trinity of tank design is about firepower protection and mobility. Traditionally, the Russians have always gone for firepower and mobility. And uh, a lot of their tanks, quite small, quite low profile, difficult to acquire, difficult to hit, but quite mobile. But we've seen in Ukraine that actually that lack of protection means that they brew up very easily. The other reason they brew up is that, that Russian tanks traditionally have what we call autoloaders. Therefore, the ammunition is loaded into the main gun automatically without a crew member there. Uh, and when you have that system, it's very difficult to have what we call armoured charge bins. In other words, put your ammunition in a protected area that if there are sparks or explosions won't blow up, um, which is why we see um, a lot of the Russian tanks, even when they're hit by a grenade or, or something's dropped through the hatch, they blow up because their, their ammunition is not protected. Now, the T-14 has a crewless turret. The turret contains an autoloader with 32 rounds in it and the gun itself. So not having anybody in the turret is, as a tank commander, if I'm commanding the tank at sort of low level, to me that makes it very, very difficult for manoeuvre, getting into the right place, etc., etc. But as I said at the beginning, the, the T-14 is a big tank. Again, look at the video, how high it is, how easy it is to acquire. The Russians admit that it's not very well armoured. They say that the protection comes from what we call defensive aid suites, clever electronics. And I'll come back to that because I think that's key. The other thing, when you look at the armament, the main armament, and it's a key thing in Russian tanks, they've gone for a 120 millimeter smooth bore. 
the favoured tank gun in Ukraine at the moment is actually the Challenger 2 120mm rifled gun. Now, what do we mean by rifled and smoothbore? Brits have always gone for rifled tank guns, or certainly Challenger 1, Challenger 2 and Chieftain, because it means you can be more accurate over a longer distance and you can also fire different types of ammunition what we call long rod penetrators, the sort of tungsten darts that use kinetic energy to destroy tanks, chemical weapon energy rounds with explosives in it. So the Russians have gone contrary to this. And one of the key elements that tanks have been used in Ukraine is what we call long range snipers. So perhaps they've gone wrong there. But when you look at the video and see the T-14 moving around, you will see that the, the gun, the main gun itself, doesn't move at all which means it's not stabilised. So if you are driving a tank over terrain, and ideally you want to be able to fire at enemy tanks as you're moving, your gun needs to be stabilised. In other words, it needs to stay in one position to sort of float. Now look at the T-14, it doesn't. Now I have on pretty good authority as well that it's fire control system. And what I mean by that is, is that the electronics on board that allow the gun to be pointed at the target and hit the target and acquire other targets is very poor. It doesn't have what we call a hunter-killer type capability. So in, in Abrams and, and Leopard and, and Challenger 2, the commander and the gunner can work together looking at different targets and when the gun's ready, it can fire at one and move on to the other. So it would appear that the Almaty fire control, and it looks like a direct copy of a Conqueror tank. This is a British tank that came out in 1944. I mean, look at the two. I'll try and post two pictures and they are almost the same. So that is why I'm saying white elephant. And one further piece on this, it is in the public domain that the Russians deployed a few T-14s to Syria. Um, not many, single figures, but it would appear that at least two of them were destroyed by anti-tank guided weapons, which seems incredible. And these are what one would call first generation anti-tank guided weapons, old ones, not the sort of end laws that we're seeing in Ukraine. So if a tank can be destroyed by an anti-tank guided weapon, I'd be pretty confident sat in a Challenger 2 to survive. And in fact, we know from a lot of the engagements that the Challenger 2 and, and Leopard have been, they've actually survived anti-tank guided weapons. So putting that all together, it doesn't seem to conform to the Holy Trinity of firepower, protection, and mobility. There seem to be a lot of key design flaws and the excuse that it's too valuable and expensive not to use it, uh, I think is complete bunkum. And I agree with Dom. It's a tank for the parade ground, not the battlefield. Well, thank you very much, Hamish, for that. That was absolutely fascinating. I know you've got one more update for us looking at the UK and Australia. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, ha having served with the Australian military and, and got to know a lot of people down there, when there are UK Australian defence stories, I, I usually get a call from my friends at ABC News at about midnight asking me to comment. But, but in this case, I think a really important thing, part of the overall picture. So I think everybody is aware that Australia is part of the Five Eyes uh, community. That's the UK, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And we share intelligence on a very close basis. So we are, in that way, we're very closely affiliated. And of course, we've always been very close to the Australians. I think people will be aware of the AUKUS program, which is the nuclear powered submarines being built by BAE. I think this is the US, the UK, and Australia, you know, much the chagrin of the French who thought they were going to build them. So, again, very close liaison. But at the moment, I think still Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, and Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary in Australia, and yesterday signed a defence agreement, which, although on the face of it, you know, we are so close anyway, I, I think actually is quite significant. I've written a piece, I think that's out later, on the briefing at RUSI yesterday about the new model army and, and the need for the UK to refocus its defence. A lot of the challenges I think we've had in the last few years is perhaps UK defence is being spread a bit too thinly. We've invested a lot in maritime assets to protect the Far East, as it were. But but actually, I mean, it's to me, that's where Australia comes in. 
of course, they are fixated with the Far East, the South China Sea, and all that area. But to have it sort of have it as a formalized agreement that Australia focuses there, which will allow the UK to focus more directly on threats close to home. The, the other thing I'm sure people are well aware of that the Australian military have been helping the UK a lot with training Ukrainians. And in fact, there have been a lot of Australian troops uh, in, on Salisbury Plain behind me doing that. So I think this is a really good strategic move by Australia and the UK. And actually, in a way, will help us in the UK focus more on the most immediate threat, which is Ukraine and the Russian hordes there. Well, thank you very much, Hamish, for joining us. Uh, that was really fascinating. Let's move now, just because we do have a uh, an interview as well for this episode, to our final thoughts. Dom Nichols, I know you've got a slightly longer one today. Yeah, not well, not that long, but uh, well, we'll see, shall we? So earlier on, I was talking about the Estonian Defence Minister uh, announcing the um, uh, l- latest package of, of assistance for Ukraine and Kaya Kallas in Brussels yesterday, and her and her choice of words. Also, Dutch Defence Minister in Ukraine today and Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, who, who visited Kyiv very recently, jockeying, as I said, in this context of, of the next NATO Secretary General. I would just point people, if they are so minded, have a look at Monday's Telegraph. We've got an article in there from Gabriel Elefteriu, who's the Deputy Director of the Council on Geostrategy, where he was talking about next NATO Sec Gen, and he was saying the next person must come from Eastern Europe. He said those frontline states, hugely exposed to Russian pressure and propaganda that's genuinely believed in Moscow, uh, and they are painted as lapdogs of of the West. And a lot of the similar arguments that are being thrown at them have been used by Putin to justify the full scale invasion. So Mr. Elefteriu says Mark Rutte, who is seen to be the kind of front runner, Gabriel Elefteriu says he should be disqualified as a candidate by his failure as Dutch Prime Minister, I'm reading from the article now, by his failure as Dutch Prime Minister to ever come close to bringing the Netherlands' defence spending up to the 2% of GDP NATO target. Those breaking the alliance's core spending pledge should not be rewarded with its highest post, says Mr. Efteri. He then has a look at um, Kaya Callas. Ms. Efteri has, a, has an issue with her as well. He says uh, she has a very vocal style and an ultra-hawkish stance on Russia and the war. He says, whatever the merits of those positions, that makes her too divisive to be a secretary general. Um, He says she has consistently advocated for the most radical policy of total defeat of Russia and no peace until all of Ukraine's lands are freed. He says this is now plainly unrealistic. His words. Uh, He says she has backed Emmanuel Macron's notion of possible Western intervention in Ukraine, a foolish and irresponsible proposition. So doesn't doesn't have to truck with either of those two. Then he raises the prospects of uh, Romania's what he calls low key but effective president, Klaus Werner Johannes. He says, Mr. Johannes, right from the start of his tenure as president, he secured a 10 year cross party agreement on spending at least 2% of GDP on defence. That's now up at 2.5%. And Mr. Elfteriu says Johannes has also overseen a policy of strong yet discreet support for Kiev from the critical first days of the war, preferring practical results to public fanfare and refraining from callous style incendiary rhetoric. So bunging a very large rock into a, into the pond there, um, some thoughts on where the next NATO gen should come from. I do think it should be from the east, uh, but some comments there about why. Ms. L.F. Terry thinks Mark Rutte and Kaya Callas are not the right people and, and he's backing President uh, Johannes of Romania. Be very interested in people's thoughts on that. I mean, what for starters, do you think being in charge of your country and not raising defence spending to the NATO target of 2%, is that an immediate red line and you, are, you, you, you should not be considered if that's the position you've taken? Question number one. Question number two, do you think Kaya Callas' very firm rhetoric is unhelpful when looking at who should be a secretary general um yeah uh, answers on a postcard i've got my own thoughts but i won't i won't air them right now because um, i'd be very interested to hear what uh, what your thoughts are thanks david thank you very much dom and yes as dom said please do feel free to get in touch it'd be very interesting and it's very good i think to raise some of these criticisms and thoughts from from other people from other experts as well because it really does give us a a broader sense of how people are thinking about this hey mish as our guest would you like the very final words yes thanks very much <clears throat> I had a very interesting meeting earlier on this week with 
a board member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And, and you would think that there wasn't much common ground between us. But actually, there, were, there was a lot, particularly on conventional defence. She agreed with me that that's where we should be focusing on. She was pro- a lot younger than me in her, her 30s. She also said a very interesting thing. She thought that the, the youngsters in this country were basically pacifists and not up for a fight. Um, and, we, and I said, well, you know, if things go badly in Europe, then then that is going to change rapidly. And I'm not going to go into the whole sort of conscription piece uh, and everything else. But what we did agree on was, was about nuclear proliferation, which I think is is one of, if not the greatest threat to the planet at the moment. Uh, and I see today, or maybe it was yesterday, that Signor Grossi, head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, who we've discussed doing inspections of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, is in Syria to help the Syrians with their nuclear power program, w- which I find absolutely extraordinary. So um, I suppose my final thought is when it comes to nuclear, proliferation is something we absolutely stamp on and we mustn't make it any easier for, for the tyrants around the world uh, to gain this power uh, than than possible. And having the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Syria discussing it with Assad seems an extraordinary move to me. Coming up, we speak to Sarah Brown, chair of the UK charity Their World, on their charity's work with Ukrainian schoolchildren. Well, Sarah Brown, thank you so much for your time. Would you start just by introducing yourself and your work to our listeners? Thank you. Yes, I'm the chair of a children's charity called Their World, and we're very focused on education, particularly for children who are caught up in crisis, which is why we've been doing a lot of work over the last two years for Ukrainian children, both children who are inside the country, but also those that are in host countries outside. Well, can we start just by characterising in in broad terms the impact of the full-scale war on education for Ukrainian children? Well, first of all, I think we have to take into account that the pandemic disrupted Ukrainian children's education. So they lost those two years. And now the two years of the war. So it's, it's compounded the issue for them. Children who are displaced from their own homes, who have their communities disrupted in large and small ways. I think there's no child that's not affected by the war, but certainly those that have been caught in the direct line of conflict have had to flee to places of safety, either other parts of Ukraine or being hosted in other countries. But even children who have in areas maybe less affected, will have other children coming into their schools, will have uh, other buildings being used, school buildings being repurposed. Um, so there's an awful lot of disruption. Um, and I, there, you know, there are many children who have really not had a day in the classroom for the last four years. And you mentioned there the difference between the students who are abroad and the students still in the country. Could you just talk a little bit about that? What kind of, how do their needs differ? How are schools and teachers keeping track of those who, who have left and maybe stayed abroad? Well, their world first became involved because we were we have a business coalition where we always have a number of companies in the corporate sector, large scale companies who look to get involved and contribute where there's education in emergencies. So we've done work in Lebanon and work in the Greek islands and in other areas. So we were approached to say, was there anything we could do to help provide support for children in Ukraine? And at the same time, we had a conversation with HP, the technology company, who had 70,000 laptops available that they said they would gift to the coalition that we could distribute for Ukrainian children if we could find out a way to do so. So that was really our first entry point in understanding where children were at the start of the war. So with 70,000 laptops, we then had to meet the challenge of putting software on it. Microsoft, another partner, came on board to do that. There were lots of issues around distribution, lots of issues around how you upload the software. It all has to be done individually. We worked with a lot of on-the-ground local organisations, local NGOs as partners. What happened over that period of time, we've distributed those 70,000 laptops. About 38,000 went to children inside Ukraine, and the balance 32,000 went to children in Hungary, Poland, Moldova, surrounding countries. And I think your question about what's the difference in their experience, I think for those those children who've left the country, they're hosted in a community that will feel safer to them, but equally strange. They're not in their own home. They have language issues where they're learning in other languages in the classroom. They're also feeling that that's a temporary stopgap. 
Every family seems to have the dream to go home at some point, or at least back into Ukraine. So that shift to whether you're learning language, but also being able to keep up your own Ukrainian language and all the relevant learning there. So that's been that challenge for children outside. For children inside the country, again, there's that same sense of displacement from your own community and being hosted, but the curriculum is the same and the language is the same. So you have that familiarity. And then, of course, you know, you'll know it depends where you are in the country for how safe you feel. Everyone's affected, but the war, the actual conflict is far closer for some. Some, you know, there are some children going to school where they can hear it in the distance. Thinking about teachers then, as we mentioned before we started recording, I was in a school about two weeks ago in Astoria Patrisky, north of Kiev, and one of the things that struck me was, A, just how talented and brilliant the teachers were, but equally just the huge number of issues and challenges that they had to deal with that weren't necessarily present before, or at least there were quite a few issues that have become so much worse. So they were, they're, now, they're, they're now fulfilling something of a social role, a social worker role with their kids whose parents might be in the armed forces, some of whom might have died. The fact that, as you said, you've got lots of internal displacement, so Class sizes in certain schools will be a lot larger because there'll be lots of kids coming in and class sizes in other places might be a lot lower because lots of kids have left. There's, I mean, the, the list just goes on and on of the things that teachers now have to deal with that they didn't have to deal with before. It would be interesting to hear a little bit about your work with teachers and supporting them. Like, what are their biggest challenges when they, when they talk to you? What do they need and what do you give them? Well, certainly with the last laptop distribution programme, that was making sure that the devices had gone to teachers as much as to individual children, individual households. And we know that from a kind of overview of the effectiveness of that with teachers using those laptops, they're reaching a total of 1.6 million children. So that support with technology has been giving teachers that flexibility. And obviously, for teachers who are outside the country, they've needed extra support. So we've supported the Stay With Ukraine program, where you keep up language learning and, and engagement and conversations with other Ukrainians. Inside the country, the Uh, programs that their world announced for the second anniversary had come directly from meetings we'd had last September with President Zelensky and with his team. And they want a very big drive on maths and science. I think they felt they were already behind on maths and science, even at the start of the conflict, and it's becoming more profound. And with anyone with a vision to go back and rebuild a country, those are certainly skills that are going to need to be there. So what we've done is working with the Ukrainian government and investing in a new museum of mathematics that will be built as a physical building, is being built as a physical building in Kyiv, in the capital, but has plans to distribute programs, learning, tutoring, traveling exhibitions that will go around the country. And all the time will maintain that flexibility to deliver maths and science learning for teachers. And much of it is driven by what teachers are wanting and needing. And I've no doubt that it will need to stay flexible and stay moving. The Museum of Mathematics will exist as a physical structure. So there's a plan for 120,000 different exhibitions and exhibits. And of those, the plan is to reach 3,000 teachers and 300,000 children with the travelling exhibitions and travelling tutor programmes. So it's quite an ambitious project to start with. Obviously, also, it's quite a bold move to think of building a new physical structure in somewhere with conflict. But I think that's really been part of it. I mean, throughout your podcast, the theme of the resilience and the determination and the optimism to keep rebuilding what gets knocked down. And I think this speaks to that. Absolutely. Do you I mean, do we have a a time frame for this? When will this be open for kids to start learning again? So the expectation is it will be open before the end of this year. All the work is going on at the moment and will build. And certainly all the education programs that will be there ready to roll out during the course this year. So we're investing in it. UNICEF are also in partnership with it and the Ukrainian government. That's very exciting. Congratulations. Can I ask about another initiative that's spoken about on your website? And it says, I'm just going to find my notes, it says Their World is also working with the Ukrainian government on a national childhood education and development initiative to support children in the important five first years of their lives. Could you tell us more about this? And again, it'd be quite interesting to hear the pr- sort of precise concrete things that, that are being done. I mean, when I was in the school in Stary Petrovsky, I think the youngest kids we saw or spoke to were about f- maybe six or seven. And as you said, it's quite interesting because their, their, their stories are not, it's not just the full scale invasion, it's also the pandemic before that. So it's, it's such an important thing that I hadn't really considered that we're not just talking about two years of incredibly bad disruption. It's actually four years, but in, in, very, differing, in, in very different ways. So yeah, so, so what, are you, what are you doing there exactly? What, what, are the, what, are, what does the initiative mean? 
Well, if we start with the point that those early years are so crucial, 90% of a baby of a child's brain is developing in those first five years. That investment for early learning, early childhood develop is so critical. It's something that their world works with more broadly in other global areas, other areas where we work around the world. And we're part of a bigger global initiative to to drive a campaign to act for early years. So this is a very specific program where we've worked with the government teams, worked with the Ministry of Education and Science. We've worked with the President's Office, with the Elena Zelenska Foundation. And everyone wants to come behind this investment in early years. Because of the experience that we've had in putting together early years teams, helping develop policies, what we're doing is sitting down and working with them so that we're putting in people who can actually come up with a strategy for the country, come up with a program that has built in flexibility given the circumstances that they find themselves in. But it's about finding ways to reach those youngest children. We know that so many of them are not able to attend early childcare centres. Parents will obviously keep their youngest children at home to keep them safe. Many of the childcare centres that exist are actually being, those are the ones that are repurposed and used as centres for other things. So it's really, really will be behind the curve. You've got children who don't have the chance to be part of any uh, integration or childcare centres with others. And we need to be able to do something about that. What we do know is that for children who start school age five, eight, six, where they haven't had that input, it will put them at a disadvantage that will last throughout their education and the implications, of course, for the whole of the rest of their lives. So this is a really important program. I think it's phenomenal, really, that in the middle of a conflict, you have a government and a team there who are able to pay attention to this. I think too often in wars around the world, children are the greatest casualties of it. They're, the thought that's given to children is, is not enough for never mind how to keep them safe, but how to have them learn to be nurtured, to be able to fulfill opportunities for the longer term. So to see this happening inside Ukraine with this investment in early years, I think we're very proud at Their World to be part of how they build their strategy, how they put the team in, how we'll create a policy for them to be able to work, even in the circumstances they find in. And of course, the plan is that this will be something that will grow stronger and stronger beyond the war. Would you like to talk a little bit about your experiences in Ukraine? I know you, you visited, I think, I think you said you last visited in September. What, what did you see and what surprised you about that? Well, last September, I only visited Ukraine. I went in on the overnight train from Poland and to a city I hadn't visited before. So I don't, didn't know quite what to expect. And I was there at, for the First Lady's conference that she was hosting. She had a theme last year for mental health and there was a big focus on um obviously PTSD and mental health issues for soldiers, but there was a whole section there on youth and children. And that was the part that I was taking part in and chairing a discussion. What I thought, my impressions in arriving in the city, I arrived to sirens, people coming out of the overnight air raid shelters. You can see the all the protections that are there to prevent from missile attacks, sandbags everywhere, soldiers everywhere, and these very moving large images of fallen soldiers where there's a strong determination not to forget those who've made that sacrifice for their country. So all the signs of war are so visible. And yet there's a city that is absolutely going about its daily business. I think it's fascinating the way they've accommodated. So things that would normally have taken place in the evening, I was talking to someone who's a stand-up comedian, and instead of these late night comedy shows, they just start at four o'clock in the afternoon and make sure they're all done by the curfew. And, And just that flexibility and resilience. And I think I took that lesson away thinking, Everything we're doing to plan and design early years programs, education programs, support the maths and science investment is we need to have that same built in resilience for a program, but also the flexibility. If you need to change the hours of the day, if you need to change who doubles up in a classroom, if you need to find different ways to reach people using technology, then nothing's there to stop you having a go at trying to make everything happen. What kind of challenges are you finding working in Ukraine and how have you been solving them? So I think it's not us directly as as an external UK charity that solves every problem. I think what we're there to do is to put in all of the tools. We've been providing the devices, providing software, providing financing for some of the plans for the museum. We'll contribute to supporting developing curriculum, developing policy and planning for the early years. But it's working with Ukrainian people, working with the teachers, working with the policymakers, working with the museum team, for them to be able to do it. So our job is to 
try and find the resources, try and bring in expertise. And the other thing we've done is also make sure that we have people who can come and speak on the external stage. President Zelensky has been a very powerful spokesperson for his own country, and we see a very visible person. But there are other strong Ukrainian voices. And we've, at their world, were able to organize things at the UN last September. We made sure their minister came and was able to meet people and speak people and share the message of what they were doing. So it's not just a message of how the war is being fought, but it's also a message about how children can live and thrive no matter the circumstances. Lots of our listeners obviously care deeply about what happens in Ukraine. And I know that in the past, we, we get people writing to us when they hear things about you know supporting children, supporting early years education, asking how they can help. What would you say to them who might hear this interview and think, this is something I want to do? How, what should they do? How would they go about it? Well, one of the things we've agreed to support the Ukrainian government with their what they're calling a devices coalition. They have a, a drive to raise another 125,000 laptops. We are currently negotiating with different technology partners to get the cheapest price we can. And we think we can do a laptop with all the distribution, all the software and get it into the hands of the teacher or the child for £200 each. So we're putting a big fundraising device drive behind that because I think that notion of being able to raise £200. We have a, a, a fundraising walk during the month of June where people are counting their steps but raising money to get these laptops across. So that's one way that people can get involved and do something tangible and say, right, I'll make sure that I'm a person who can put a laptop in the hands of a child for learning. But there are other ways. I think not letting the Ukrainian people be forgotten amidst a lot of news, a lot of conflict. It's an easy one to kind of move on from, in part, I think, because we feel that Ukrainians are doing so well themselves. But you'll know from your reporting that there's some very heavy um, conflicts coming up. The east of Ukraine is feeling under enormous pressure. I think this is a war that affects all of us and a war where we can stand in solidarity and find a way to do something. So when you're asked to speak up about it or share a message about it or find a way to contribute, I think there's lots of ways to do it. And, and finally, looking back over your work and your charity's work in Ukraine over the past two years, what for you has been the most important, the most moving moment uh, or policy that, you, that you've seen have an impact? I think from the starting point where we had a phone call to say, here's 70,000 laptops, can you do something with them? Being able to mobilise it so that you can actually put the pieces together and finding the goodwill from people. You know, you start with various warehouses full of laptops in boxes and it's not that easy to work out how to get them up and running individually loaded. So to see the effort of a chain of people connecting piece by piece by piece so that we can reach 1.6 million children has been really heartening. And it's why I'm quite excited about the programs that we have for early years for the maths and science programs and also for the new devices coalition that I think the network of people that can come behind to make that all happen. I hope that this time next year there is no war, but what I hope regardless of that outcome, is that there are children who are able to learn no matter their circumstances, that we give them a safe place to learn and are able to give them the best start in life and the skills they need for the future. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1 pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, Please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, 